Hi, this is the second video dedicated to the subject of, the, of fluid drift turbulence in plasmas, which is an interesting subject which is relevant for uh, uh, magnetized plasma, so in particular for uh, nuclear fusion by magnetic confinement, which is the, the subject which I study and uh, which I'm working now. Um, this is the second video uh, of a series, uh, which will be made of three videos. The first one, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, I will make a link in the description so that you can uh, look at it. I, I talked about uh, what is called the parallel dynamics. So it is a kind of dynamics which involves different modes of oscillation, uh, which take place uh, in the direction parallel to the magnetic field. In this video, I will talk about the, par the perpendicular dynamics, uh, which is somehow more complicated and involves also the presence of, of some uh, equilibrium gradients. So we have uh, no longer an uh, homogeneous background, so we have uh, equilibrium uh, pressure gradients. And we will see how this complicates the, the picture. In particular, it introduces uh, the drift waves, uh, which are in part important uh, phenomena in, in this kind of, of, uh, of dynamics uh, and in magnetized plasmas. Um, and if in the third video, um, I will talk about turbulence. So uh, the first two videos deal only with linear phenomena, where the amplitude of the perturbations, which are, take place in the plasma, are not large enough to, uh, to give rise to quadratic nonlinearities. In the third video, I will also consider the fact that uh, um, the, the amplitude can be large enough to, be, uh, to give rise to some quadratic nonlinearities, and I will explain how uh, the interaction between different modes, so characterized by different uh, wave numbers in a spectrum, for example, uh, can give rise to uh, coupling between modes and so the turbulence. I didn't tell you at the beginning, but uh, uh, all this material is taken from the work by Bruce Scott, uh, which is named Low Frequency Fluid Drift Turbulence in Magnetized Plasma, which is a uh, very exhaustive, a very, um, let's say, um, large work, which covers a, a, a large amount of, of, uh, of subjects all related to these things. As just like in the first video, I prepared some slides and now I'm going to show you some equations. Okay, before we start with the physics, or better with the equations, I have to remind some uh, information, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, hypotheses of the problem, which are necessary to understand what, uh, what follows. So, um, I mentioned already, I mean, I explained in the previous video, that we are dealing with uh, a, a simple plasma, so a plasma made of uh, electrons and a single species of ions, and in the presence of a magnetic field, so that the plasma is magnetized, and the presence of magnetic field introduces some effects, for example, the, the drift effects caused by the interaction between uh, uh, gradients of quantities with the magnetic field, and the uh, gyration, the gyration motion of uh, charged particles around magnetic field lines. Uh, in the previous video, we have seen that uh, um, in, the, in the presence of a homogeneous background, so without equilibrium gra uh, gradients, we, uh, we had some kind of dynamics uh, which involved uh, alpha waves and, um, uh, and uh, sound waves or acoustic waves, uh, and the uh, alpha waves were also affected by the presence of electron pressure, and, and so they uh, were, co were called kinetic shear alpha waves, because they were uh, usual alpha waves, which are oscillations in the magnetic field, uh, coupled with the uh, oscillations in the electron pressure. Uh, and we also had uh, sound waves. And so the solution for the system that we developed, which was a four-field system of equations, um, had the two uh, classes of solutions. Um, one which was uh, high frequency, and which included also the alpha waves, and one which was uh, low frequency, which uh, included also the sound waves. And uh, they, uh, they could recover the usual alpha velocity and the usual uh, sound velocity in appropriate limits. And these modes were dispersive because the phase velocity were dependent on the perpendicular um, wave numbers or wave vectors, and so there was dispersion for different uh, modes. Here we extend this um, uh, calculation or these descriptions to the case of a non-homogeneous background, uh, where we can have also equilibrium gradients, in particular an equilibrium uh, pressure gradient, and we will see how the uh, E cross B advection, which is the main uh, flow uh, which uh, takes place in the plasmas caused by electron and magnetic fields, uh, has some uh, 
uh, uh, effect on these equilibrium gradients and leads to the uh, to the uh, onset of uh, drift waves. Uh, so in a in homogeneous background, uh, we didn't have equilibrium, um, uh, let's say, advection or, equi or equilibrium gradients. And so the, the, um, the uh, advective uh, contribution of E cross B on the perturbation was only uh, quadratic. Um, so basically, this is non-linear because it involves uh, uh, the perturbation both in the uh, in the flow and in the perturbation uh, which is uh, uh, advected by the flow. Uh, instead, in a non-homogeneous background, we can have a contribution from the E cross B advection to the linear effects uh, because we have an, an E cross B um, uh, perturbation, let's say, uh, which operates on some uh, quantities which are uh, which uh, which are at the zero order, so basically uh, which um, uh, are part of the background of the plasma. So the E cross B advection on the equilibrium uh, density or pressure gradients uh, contributes to the linear effect. So it can be studied in the linear framework. And um, and in particular, the, as I said already, the interaction between the E cross B drift or E cross B uh, flow with the adiabatic electron dynamics, uh, which means that uh, it is the kind of electron dynamics where the pressure uh, tends to uh, reach an equilibration, let's say, uh, with the electrostatic potential due to the fast dynamic of the electrons. And so this phenomenon leads to the, uh, to the phenomenon of the drift waves. And before I continue uh, with this um, description, which can be quite complicated, I will show you again some sketch uh, which represents the kind of uh, uh, phenomenon that we are going to talk about. So this is similar to what I've shown you already in the first video, and it represents some uh, schematic uh, pictures of the different flows and, uh, um, yeah, and the dynamics which take place in this uh, environment. So this picture is the same that I show you uh, in the first video. This represents the interaction between the uh, E cross B drift, which is caused by some perturbation in the electrostatic potential, and the equilibrium pressure gradient. Uh, so these pictures um, represent the dynamics in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the plane, is entering the plane indicated here by this cross. The, the grad B, uh, so the, the pressure gradient, is in the x direction, so this, we call this horizontal direction the x direction, and the E cross B drift is rotating in the XY plane, so it causes this vortex like structure. And you see that uh, the, because of the presence of some gradient in some direction, uh, periodically the uh, E cross B will be in the same, in the opposite direction to the, with respect to the gradient, or in the same direction. And so it will work uh, in, one, uh, in one moment uh, to amplify some pressure perturbation, and in the other moment to uh, decrease them. And so this, uh, this shows already that uh, the presence of this E cross B drift um, can, in, can uh, drive or suppress, or in, in any case, it can trigger some uh, pressure instabilities. Uh, then this uh, kind of dynamics gives rise to some modes which propagates in the y direction, which is uh, the, the way the, one of the two directions perpendicular to the magnetic field. So we are talking about a, a wave-like perturbation, which is called a drift wave. It is one-dimensional because it propagates in one direction and oscillates in the perpendicular direction. So in this uh, picture, the, the y direction here is the propagation direction, so indicated by the wave vector of this, of this perturbation. And the, the, um, uh, this wave is oscillating in the x direction, which is the same direction of the gradient of the equilibrium pressure. And these, uh, the flow is, uh, is uh, pushed by the E cross B uh, flow, E cross B velocity, and it is mostly an oscillation in the electrostatic potential. Uh, however, because of the um, fast dynamics of the electrons, this also causes an, uh, an oscillation in the pressure. So we have this uh, interaction between E cross B and the um, uh, oscillations in the electrostatic potential and the electron pressure. So this is a wave oscillating in this x direction and propagating in the y direction, and the magnetic field is uh, in the vertical direction, let's say uh, z uh, in z axis. Um, and then I also anticipate something which I will explain better uh, in a second time in this video. 
uh, which uh, explains the role of the relative phase between the pressure and the electrostatic potential, which is the main perturbations which are taking place in this in this kind of mode, and how this um, uh, has effect on the energy which drives this kind of, of motion. So in this left picture, uh, the dashed line and the continuous line corresponds respectively to the pressure and to the electrostatic potential uh, oscillations or perturbations. And in, this la in the last picture, you see that these are almost coincident, so they overlap, which means that there is little phase difference between them. And for a reason that I, I will uh, explain better later, uh, in this, this corresponds to the uh, nearly adiabatic electron, so uh, pressure and, uh, and the electrostatic potential are in phase. And this has the effect of having very little drive on this mode. Uh, so there is no energy provided uh, to, to drive this mode. On the right, we have some larger phase shift between them, and for some reason related to the how the energy depends on this uh, phase, uh, in this phase shift, this uh, corresponds to a much larger drive of the instability. So it is not only the adiabatic response of the electrons and the presence of some of some equals b uh, drift that uh, causes this instability, but there is also a role in the phase between them. So this was uh, a somehow uh, anticipation of what will follow, and now we can start uh, developing or uh, deducing the models which um, uh, which give us the, uh, the equations for the drift waves according to different approaches. So we start with simple uh, this simple model, um, which already gives us some uh, elementary form of the drift waves, and this is obtained by taking the total time derivative of the pressure. Uh, and put, put it uh, equal to zero. If we write it explicitly, the total time derivative as the partial time derivative plus the um, E cross B drift, um, which uh, operates on the, on the pressure gradient. So this is the advective term. So this is the total uh, advective deri derivative. Uh, then to proceed, one has to linearize this equation. So one has to separate the equilibrium part plus the perturbation and uh, solve these equations for the perturbation to the pressure. So we have on the left hand side a partial time derivative of the uh, perturbation to the pressure. And on the right hand side, we have the uh, convective term, which involves the perturbation to the equals B drift uh, times the uh, equilibrium pressure gradient, because this time we allow to have some equilibrium pressure gradient. Uh, this equation can be written in a more uh, useful form by introducing this characteristic length, which is defined here as a, uh, 1 over LP, is the logarithmic gradient of the pressure. So this tells you the, um, a, let's say, characteristic uh, length scale of variation of this equilibrium pressure gradient. And once uh, one uh, some, somehow rewrites this equation in these terms, it finds out that the uh, partial time derivatives of the per, uh, pressure gradient, pressure perturbation, is proportional to this uh, y derivative of the electrostatic potential uh, times this combination of uh, constants. And this, is, uh, this can be expressed in terms of a frequency. In particular, we have the drift frequency, which is this combination of constants, here written in terms of uh, uh, y wave, wave, uh, wave vector times the uh, ion acoustic radius and the, ions, uh, velocity, the, um, the sound velocity. Or it can be expressed also in terms of drift velocity uh, by dividing just by the, uh, uh, the wave vector, and you get this uh, drift velocity. Uh, this will appear also in the later equation, but up to this point, this is not uh, yet a wave equation because uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the correct um, uh, order of derivatives, and also it involves two different fields, so we have to make some further uh, simplification. And uh, in particular, we are going to use the adiabatic response, uh, which is due to the fast electron, uh, let's say, uh, dynamics uh, in, in presence of electric fields. And it is the kind of a response that tries to um, equilibrate the pressure um, so that it reaches some value which is consistent with the electrostatic potential. And I have already explained it in the previous video, but I will remind it later. Uh, this is possible, so we can use this adiabatic uh, uh, hypothesis because the kind of dynamics which we are considering is considered to take place on time scale which are 
uh, much larger than the uh, equilibration time for the adiabatic response, and at the same time, these time scales, uh, characteristic of the drift motions, are much shorter than, um, yeah, sorry, are, are much faster, so the time scales are much shorter than the ion sound dyna or the sound wave dynamics. So we are in this range of frequencies. And uh, uh, the, the velocities which enter here are uh, the generalized alphan velocity, which uh, um, is not just the simple alphan velocity, but uh, it reduces to this in appropriate limits. And this Vs is the generalized sound velocity. And this corresponds more or less to the different uh, um, to the different regimes that we deduced in the first video for the parallel uh, dynamics. So the adiabatic uh, hypothesis amounts to uh, imposing this, uh, this equality. So electrostatic, uh, sorry, the um, perturbed pressure normalized to the equilibrium pressure is equal to E phi over T, so to this non-dimensional uh, combination, which involves the electrostatic potential. And when we do it uh, in the previous equation, we find out this time um, uh, that this operator, so time derivative plus V drift times d over dy, operating on this combination, uh, which involves only the electrostatic potential, this is equal to zero. Now, this looks like a wave equation, but it is not exactly a wave equation because it is only first order in time and space. And this tells you uh, already that the, um, this mode is only propagating, so it doesn't correspond to any instability. And also, it doesn't have any uh, counterpart which propagates in the opposite direction, which is the case if we have a wave equation which has two uh, solutions propagating in opposite directions. So this is only a first model which already provides us some, uh, some kind of uh, intuition, but it is not sufficient. So for a more advanced model, uh, one can consider instead this equation. This is an equation which involves the uh, ion density, this time, and I, and it involves uh, the E cross B advection, so the E cross B drift. But this time we have also this other term, this additional term, which consists in the polarization uh, drift. So, in the, so this polarization drift is an effect which uh, is important when we allow for a time-dependent um, electrostatic potential or electric field. Uh, if one solves uh, the equation, let's say, for the, uh, for the momentum equation, so for the uh, velocity, uh, one finds out that there is an additional drift which uh, uh, is caused by the time-dependent electric field, and it is proportional to the total derivative of this uh, uh, electric field, or if you prefer, gradient of the electrostatic potential. Uh, again, one can replace this expression here and then linearize, as we did before, to evolve only the perturbations and keep the uh, advective term caused by, in this case, by the drifts, uh, for the drift velocity. And this time we have also this other uh, contribution, which is uh, uh, proportional to the time derivative of the electrostatic potential uh, times this uh, rho s square nabla perp square. So this introduces the perpendicular uh, gradients uh, times the uh, ion uh, lambda radius. Uh, to simplify, so the, to express this uh, only in terms of electrostatic potential, one has to impose the quasi-neutrality, which means that the ion and the electron densities are equal. And we use again the adiabatic hypothesis so that we can express the, uh, the electron density is a function of the electrostatic potential. And when we do it, we find out this new equation, which looks like the equation uh, that I showed before, but we have this additional term in the term with the time derivative. This additional term uh, is responsible, is caused by the uh, polarization drift and introduces the perpendicular um, uh, dimension, let's say, or wave vectors. And so, if, in fact, if we, uh, if we move to Fourier space in the perpendicular uh, direction, we can uh, deduce some frequency for this mode, which is the omega star, which is uh, uh, the diamagnetic frequency, which I have uh, uh, shown you before, over 1 plus k uh, um, per square rho s square, and we call this omega l. So this is the new uh, drift frequency with this um, perpendicular dynamic corrections. And in the limit where this quantity goes to zero, we recover, so we find back the diamagnetic frequency. So this is a step ahead, but this is still not the end of the story. In fact, we are still dealing with 
a first order equation both in time and space so this is uh, only a propagating mode it is not properly a, a wave and uh, it cannot uh, have any stability because the frequency is necessarily real and we don't have any drive so there is no source for the energy which can uh, drive this uh, unstable so we, to uh, to understand to really understand the drift waves and how they arise and how they can become unstable one has to uh, to use uh, a more elaborated model and in particular one has to deal with the uh, the deviation uh, of the electron from the adi adiabatic state uh, in a self-consistent way and this uh, of course um, requires a more advanced approach and in particular this can be done including the extra terms which we will see which uh, uh, originate from the background gradients which we have introduced in this new video uh, in the four field system of equations which is the same which we solved in the previous video so there will be some additional terms which uh, <clears throat> are responsible for the drift waves and also for the uh, drive that can uh, drive them unstable and uh, in particular we will see so i anticipate that these uh, terms uh, enter through some um, contributions uh, which come from the icrus b drift and from the parallel gradient and have these forms and we will see how they look like uh, in the next uh, in the next slide so the kind of uh, the four field system that i consider here has been uh, already normalized so all the quantities have been uh, uh, rescaled with respect to some characteristic uh, uh, values so that now they are non-dimensional so all the fields which enter this uh, system are non-dimensional and they have been already linearized so we have the evolution for the perturbations and i remind you the first equation is the vorticity equation which evolves this nabla perp square phi the second equation is the equation for the electron pressure uh, the third equation is the generalized ohm law or uh, the parallel momentum equation for the electrons and the final equation is the parallel momentum equation for the ions or for the plasma if you prefer and the quantities which I have uh, uh, circled here are the additional terms which I was talking about before, which come from the Icarus B advection and the parallel uh, and the parallel gradients. Uh, here we have the Icarus B because it involves electrostatic potential, and here we have the parallel gradient which involves uh, the parallel component of the vector potential, and they are uh, they are all multiplied by this omega p which is analogous to, the, to our uh, diamagnetic frequency and it is defined as a uh, L-perp times the logarithmic gradient of the pressure. And then we have these uh, non-dimensional parameters, epsilon, beta, nu and nu, which I didn't write explicitly, but they contain the ratio between parallel and perpendicular uh, length scale, which means that uh, the, 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 let's say the competition between the parallel and perpendicular dynamics is included in these terms. Now, this uh, system of equation can be elaborated, can be uh, worked on by using some uh, algebraic uh, manipulation. And in particular, one can combine the first two equations um, by taking the difference between them. And one gets this, um, this equation, again, which looks like a sort of wave equation, uh, which have a left-hand side, which involves the uh, electrostatic and pressure uh, perturbations, electrostatic potential and pressure perturbation. On the right hand side we have parallel gradient of the velocity and these terms uh, correspond to the coupling with the sound waves. Uh, now uh, this would be more complicated to deal with but fortunately in the regimes which you are considering this right hand side is small typically so we can neglect the coupling with the sound waves and, uh, and so we are left with an equation which involves only this uh, electrostatic potential and uh, electron pressure. Um, now we can, um, let's say, uh, distinguish in this uh, the term which comes from the deviation of the electrons from the adiabatic state, um, and we call it HE, and we define it as this difference of the uh, pressure, electron pressure minus uh, this combination of quantities which involve the electrostatic potential. If HE is equal to zero, we are in the adiabatic state. Uh, and so we, by just uh, replacing this in here, we, we can um, uh, separate it on the right-hand side. 
and this this plays a role as we'll see in fact uh, once we uh, uh, we linearize further this equation by passing to uh, Fourier space so the derivatives uh, turn into uh, frequency and uh, uh, and wave vectors and so we get uh, a dispersion relation which should tell us uh, basically the uh, properties of this kind of mode of propagation and you see that uh, on the left hand side we have this term which is proportional to parallel wave factor squared times he which is uh, this um, new quantity which is in, we introduced and on the right we have all, one, uh, all the, this combination of frequencies and uh, wave vectors uh, which involve only perpendicular wave vectors and the electricity potential uh, now the term on the left cannot be neglected, cannot be put to zero, because otherwise this uh, will not correspond to a, uh, to a mode, to a proper mode. Um, and uh, another thing which I have, I have to mention is that we introduce this uh, uh, diamagnetic frequency defined as this omega p, which we did use before, times the wave vector, and c represents uh, the dissipation caused by collisionality, which is associated to uh, the own dissipation, while mu is associated to uh, to viscosity. So, uh, as I was saying, we cannot neglect this term on the left hand side because this is crucial to drive the mode uh, unstable. So to to make uh, so to make sure that this can be actually an unstable mode. In fact, it can be proven that if k parallel is zero, so the left hand side is uh, goes to zero there would be no feedback of the pressure over the electrostatic potential. In fact, uh, all we have on the right side is just electrostatic potential because uh, essentially this uh, amounts to imposing the adiabatic uh, condition. And so there would be no feedback of the pressure of the electrostatic potential. On the other, on the other hand, if we uh, assume that k parallel is very large, the adiabatic response would be too rapid for this mode and so they, it would be uh, meaningless in, in any case. So the only, uh, let's say, regime which is relevant for our cases is when k parallel is order one, in particular the most unstable, uh, most relevant modes for this instability is k parallel equals plus minus one, uh, because in this case we are uh, far from the limit of adiabatic, let's say, and far from the, uh, the limit of zero k parallel. So uh, basically, we, we are in intermediate region where this instability is, uh, is stronger. And in particular, we can also show, I didn't uh, uh, report here all the steps, but uh, uh, it can be shown that uh, to have instability is not uh, sufficient to have the sky parallel, and so to have some deviation from the adiabatic response, but we also, we also uh, need dissipation. And, um, and so this, this will be explained, it will be shown also later in the drives and the, this, and the sinks for the energy. Uh, in particular, so the conditions to have this uh, uh, growing modes are that k parallel square is equal to 1, and k per square is approximately 1. Uh, so this um, somehow gives us the range of perpendicular and parallel lengths which are relevant. So the perpendicular lengths are comparable with rho s, uh, so the ional mole radius, so they are quite small. While for the parallel lengths, uh, we are dealing with uh, large uh, lengths, which are comparable with the system size. This L parallel uh, represents the system size. And, uh, uh, and so this is uh, as a, a result of the normalization that we used, because in, in this case, the wave vectors are non-dimensional. But because they have been normalized with these quantities. And uh, in, in other uh, results which can be obtained um, comes from the energy equation. So if we deduce the, the equations which evolve the total energy of the system, we can distinguish uh, the terms which represent the drive or the instability and the sinks uh, of the energy. So uh, where the energy comes from and where the energy goes uh, or is dissipated. Uh, I already mentioned that the uh, drives for the instability come from the E cross B and from the parallel gradient. And this, these are uh, written here, although in a, in a form which is not easy to, to, to recognize. The first one is, uh, comes from the E cross B drift, so it involves electrostatic pressure and electrostatic potential, sorry, electron pressure and electrostatic potential. 
and these other terms comes from the parallel gradient and so we have the uh, uh, parallel component of the uh, of the uh, vector potential and the parallel velocity uh, and for the sinks so the where the energy is dissipated we have some correspondence in fact for the electrostatic part we have the uh, ohmic dissipation which is proportional to the uh, to the current square and for the um, parallel gradient part we have viscosity which is proportional to the parallel velocity square and this comes from uh, some uh, calculations which i have not shown and u which enters here is the total uh, uh, system energy so this somehow gives the overview of these drift waves uh, which are more complicated than uh, one could think about in first uh, approach, which involve um, uh, both the EQSB drift, parallel gradients, and we have also the perpendicular dynamics and the deviation of the pressure from the adiabatic limit. And we also identified the relevant range of parameters where these modes are more unstable. So in this second video, I try to give you an overview of the complications which arise when one considers also the perpendicular dynamics, so the presence of uh, equilibrium pressure gradient, so a non-homogeneous background, and how the, uh, the advection caused by EQSB drift and also parallel, velo parallel gradients uh, cause on this equilibrium uh, uh, pressure gradient, so we, and how this leads to the drift waves, the different approaches to study diff drift waves, so deducing uh, their equations, and their characteristic, in particular the range of values where they are uh, most unstable. And uh, this has only the uh, let's say, purpose of introducing the subject. Of course, uh, the, the topic of drift waves is very complicated and very broad. And the next video will also cover the, the, subject of, the subject of turbulence, or at least it will be more an introduction to the topic of, of turbulence, and uh, which takes place when the amplitude of the perturbation can be large enough that uh, non-linearities can be important. So the effect of perturbation, so the advection caused by the perturbation on the perturbation themselves. And I will see how this leads to mode coupling and eventually to turbulence. So this was all for this video. I hope that you appreciate it and see you in the next video.